all my years of ministry, and I don't keep count, but if I did, this would probably be sermon number 650 or so. In all my years of ministry, I don't think I've ever received as much feedback before preaching a sermon as I did for the one today. When the newsletter and weekly email and website announced that I'd be preaching a sermon entitled Whistleblowers, it was as if a floodgate, a small floodgate, had opened. Members of the church sent me their own thoughts, links to news stories, clips from radio broadcasts. Visitors to our church sent me editorials they found illuminating. Members of the wider community reached out to me. One man even sent to me his own 138-page, single-spaced, personal story of being a whistleblower and his reflections on that ordeal and the significance that it played in his life. I also got a call from an employee of the federal government who spoke with me about the annual mandatory trainings they receive on the rights and protections of whistleblowers in their department and agency. This federal employee also shared with me their own thoughts on how current events have been impacting their own feelings about working for the federal government, as well as the feelings of their coworkers, and trying to reconcile these feelings with the sworn and sacred oaths that they have taken to uphold the Constitution. I've never received this much feedback before a sermon. Thank you. The precipitating event for my comments this morning, obviously, obviously was the whistleblower letter, which came out late September, last uh, in late September, a letter alleging abuse of power of the office of the presidency and describing, at minimum, bribery, extortion, and violating federal campaign laws. And it was when this letter came out, I had this sense, I immediately thought, I want to preach a sermon on whistleblowing. I had just, a couple days earlier, sent Rachel my sermon topics for October, and so I thought to myself, oh, I don't want to redo those, I guess I'll have to push this topic back to November. And then what followed was one of the most naive thoughts I've ever had. I sure hope this topic will still be current. <laughs> and that it doesn't seem passe and dated come mid-November. I also began to reflect on this image of whistleblowing, and, and I thought of some different variations on whistleblowing that I held in contrast, in comparison to that whistleblower letter. Whistleblowing. When I was in high school, I was a lifeguard on a beach, and on several occasions I had to blow a whistle that hung from my neck, jump down from the guard chair, and, truth be told, wade out into the water, where some child had gone and bit over their head and pulled them by the arm. Whistleblowing as a <clears throat> form of safety. Whistleblowing. For a time, it was standard practice on many college campuses to issue whistles to female students as a strategy to combat sexual assault. How times have changed or not changed. Whistleblowing as a kind of way of, of calling for help, whistleblowing. There is this one very minor scene in the Academy Award-winning film Milk, the biopic of Harvey Milk, that has always stuck with me, although many people I talk with don't remember this scene from the film. According to the film, with great background, in the late 70s in San Francisco, there was an epidemic of gay bashings, attacks, hate crimes against gay men beaten up on the street for being who they were. And according to the film, the city police tended to look the other way, tended not to investigate these brutal crimes or show any sense of, of caring about them. And there is, in the, this small scene in the movie Milk, where the scene 
plays in reflection, in the reflection of a metal whistle. And the scene cuts to organizers in the gay community passing out whistles on the street and telling people, if you hear a whistle, leave the restaurants, leave the bars, leave your apartment, and go to the streets. Whistle blowing as a means of gathering community. Whistleblowers. One of the links that was sent to me, definitely the cutest link that was sent to me in the past several days, was a link to a New York Times podcast entitled, A Third Grader's Guide to the Impeachment Hearings, <laughs> in which a precocious and very intelligent and seemingly kind of cute third grader attempts to make sense of this particular moment in our nation's political life. And the interviewer asks this third grader, what is a whistleblower? And then asks him, do you know where the term whistleblower comes from? And the third grader thinks and answers, it's like in sports, where if a player breaks the rules, the referee will blow the whistle. What a comforting image, except the analogy doesn't hold. In sports, the referees are given ultimate power. The referee's decision is final. In sports, it is the referee who carries the whistle as a symbol of power and authority. But in life, the whistleblower is never the one with the power. In real life, the whistleblower is never the one with the power. And if it were as easy or as simple as simply reporting problematic behavior to your higher up or to the person in authority who's able to rectify the situation, there would be no such thing as whistleblowing. The world is not this way. Whistleblowing, by its very definition, involves drawing attention to problematic, illegal, or unethical behavior by someone who has more power than you. In fact, someone who has power over you. It involves naming the illegal or unethical behavior of your boss, or your boss's boss, or your boss's boss's boss, all the way up to the top. It's people like the CEO of the company, the leadership team of the charitable organization, the head of the agency, the president of a country. Whistleblowing is not like the referee who blows the whistle, assesses the penalty, and then calls for play to be resumed. It is, if anything, more like that scene from the movie Milk, in which whistles are carried by those in the gay community. Whistleblowing is often about what you do when you can't call who you should call. It's often about what you do when you can't call who you should call. So what do you do? What do you do when you can't call who you should call? Whistleblowers often go public with their information in the hopes that by exposing and shining a light on misdeeds in the public square, the public reaction will be sufficiently strong that those who are committing the misdeeds will be held to account in the court of public opinion. Often, when whistleblowers go public with their claims, they face backlash from those they are hoping to expose who direct their immense power to discrediting, smearing, threatening, persecuting, and prosecuting the whistleblower. And that is precisely why whistleblowing is so scary, and why it takes such courage. As it turns out, Unitarian Universalists played several significant and central roles in what is possibly the most famous whistleblower case in American history. But a lot of us didn't know that. In 1971, a man named Daniel Ellsberg released the Pentagon Papers, a massive top secret Pentagon study of our government's decision making in relation to the Vietnam War. Ellsberg, who had access to these documents, literally photocopied in the office well over 4,000 pages of this report as it began with the idea that it would go public, the Nixon administration was pitted against the press, 
and the New York Times finally went ahead and published excerpts of the Pentagon Papers. Daniel Ellsberg also leaked the Pentagon Papers to the Washington Post. There, a journalist named Ben Bagdikian, who was a Unitarian Universalist, by the way, brought the papers to a United States senator from Alaska named Mike Gravel, who was also a Unitarian Universalist, by the way, one of two UUs serving in the Senate in 1971. And Mike Gravel agreed to read the Pentagon Papers into the Congress Congressional Record because there is a rule that what, um, what is entered by a senator into the public record is you're allowed immunity for that, thus effectively making classified documents a matter of public record. So once, thanks to two Unitarian Universalists, once the Pentagon paper was made a matter of public record, the next challenge was making them available. This is way pre-internet. You can't just post it online. Gravel, Mike Gravel, approached 35 different publishers and was turned down by each and every one of them before finally he approached the 36th, Beacon Press, which is owned by the Unitarian Universalist Association, which agreed to publish the Pentagon Papers. Senator Gravel would later comment, nobody would touch it, nobody but the Unitarians, so that really locked me in. I'm a Unitarian, and I'm damn proud of it. They've got courage. And I'm very loyal to the Unitarian Church for what they did. I love that quote. And as the Unitarian Universalist Association prepared to publish the Pentagon Papers, they faced intimidation and retaliation by the Nixon administration. Nixon personally phoned the editor of Beacon Press to threaten him, telling him, quote, you seem like a nice guy. Now, when someone says to you, you seem like a nice guy, they're, they're not saying you're a nice guy. <laughs> Quote, you seem like a nice guy, and I don't want you to get into any trouble over this. The FBI, additionally, at the same time, raided the offices of the Unitarian Universalist Association and left carrying our association's complete financial records. The FBI went so far as to take the personal checks of people who had made donations to the Unitarian Universalist Association, photocopy those personal checks, and open FBI files on donors. So if you were a person who was a Unitarian Universalist before 1971 and you ever wrote a check, to the Unitarian Universalist Association, there might be an FBI file on you. Or for another reason. <laughs> for his role as a whistleblower, Daniel Ellsberg was arrested and charged with espionage, as well as theft and conspiracy. The maximum sentence for these crimes with which he was charged was 115 years in prison the judge dismissed the case. Historically, whistleblowers have helped bring to light the reasoning behind decisions to make war, the use of drones on the Arabian Peninsula and elsewhere, the practices of torture condoned by our government. Whistleblowers have had to go into hiding, flee the country. They've gone to prison and been financially devastated. Those are the most extre extreme cases. But even when the crimes and misconduct that are exposed are as much more pedestrian, whistleblowers still face dire consequences. In one interview I listened to that was sent to me by a church member, the expert on whistleblowers casually stated, if you're thinking about being a whistleblower, prepare to never be able to work in that field again. What a tremendous personal sacrifice, especially for someone who has devoted their life, decades of life to their careers. Think of the education, the debt, the training, the dues paid, the hard work to rise up through an organization. 
with all of these costs and consequences, why do whistleblowers do what they do? Earlier this week, I spoke with a member of our church who is an employee for the federal government. When they called me, the first thing they said was, I'm not making this call on government time. <laughs> they reached out to me when they learned of my sermon topic, and this person began by talking about the annual training they are mandated to attend on whistleblowing. And in one respect, being a whistleblower, reporting unethical or illegal conduct, in one respect, being a whistleblower is just doing your job. It's what you're trained to do, instructed to do, it's what you're supposed to do. And there's also the sense of, of it in the negative, which is that if you don't follow the rules, if you don't report unethical or illegal conduct, you're not only in violation of the rules and regulations, but you're also in some way complicit in that misconduct. The rules say you're supposed to do it. But it even goes deeper, though. It goes deeper than simply following the rules. For as I spoke with this federal employee, I heard invoked ideals and beliefs and values and even sacred honor. This person believed in the work they were doing, believed deeply in public service, believed in the oath they had taken to serve, not to take advantage of. This person is committed to upholding public trust. They told me, quote, when I was brought into this position, I swore an oath to uphold the Constitution. We live in an age of cynicism, an age where some people question whether there is anything but self-centeredness, and asking this question is a sign of moral impoverishment. Speaking with this church member, I found my own faith in democracy elevated by just a couple of clicks. It seems that whistleblower, whistleblowers do what they do because deep down they believe, believe in public service and public good and public trust and sacred honor and sacred oaths. There are values and principles that are locked in. The virtue is real. Deep down, it's a way of saying that virtue is real. There's a term that describes having the courage to defend a moral principle. And that term is called moral courage. They call it moral courage. Social psychologists have studied whistleblowers and others and have found that having deeply felt moral convictions, deeply felt moral concerns, is the greatest predictor and, in fact, the only predictor of whether one will report unethical behavior. Interestingly, it is a far greater predictor than whether or not you've gone through whistleblower training. They found that going through whistleblower training doesn't actually make you more likely to report. But rather, the thing that does is having deep moral convictions. How, how do we develop moral courage? How do we inspire ourselves to be more morally courageous? Perhaps it is by studying and telling and valorizing and extolling stories of morally courageous people, whether that's Daniel Ellsberg or the ordinary yet extraordinary people profiled in that Guardian story. Let us praise moral courage and work always to develop a bit more of it within ourselves. May we live by the words of Dog Hammarskjöld, <clears throat> who said, never for the sake of peace and quiet deny your own experiences and convictions. May we live by the words of Rosa Parks. You must never be fearful about what you are doing when it is right. Amen. And let us sing our closing hymn of the morning, number 115, God of Grace and God of Glory.